as a quick as a quick sort of note of reference to young scholars, irrespective of which model you choose uh, in narrative research or in phenomenological research, especially I think narrative and phenomenological especially because it's so it's so story intensive. These models are so story intensive. It's important that you create a schema, a mechanism, and I'll get into this later, um, in which you can jog your memory of the events, right? Because a lot is conveyed in body language, right? You don't know when you're interviewing so much, someone how much is conveyed in their body language, how much is conveyed in their tone, how much is conveyed in the absence of what they say. And as a good researcher, it's imperative that you document a lot of this information, right? So uh, for me, what I do is in the margins, um, I have the audio running, and in the margins, I'll, I'll write something like, um, seemed uncomfortable with the question, um, uh, uh, chuckled uh, at, at question, um, seemed hesitant. I'll, I'll, try and ex I'll try and document um, specifically at a point in the discussion, and I'll you know use references as far as time is concerned so that I can jog my memory, because what ends up happening is a year later, you go back to the data and you're reading a transcription of what was said, and it's just text. And so much is lost when it's just text. So what you should do, irrespective of which model you choose, is you should recognize that there's invariably going to be a large amount of time which separates the data collection and the analysis of that data. And in order to um, arrive at really, really solid meaning, you should, and ask your professors and and I might, I haven't, I haven't thought of it until just now. Um, I might think of, I, I might show you the method that I use myself. I, it's something I made up myself um, to sort of keep that emotional response intact so that when I go back to interpret the text, when I go back in the application of theory to what was said, um, because I didn't do grounded research, um, when I go back to the application of theory to what was said, um, I'm doing so um, with a better understanding of and a better attempt to interpret the text. When it's just cold, hard words, or when it's just cold, hard audio, it's hard to remember um, the emotions and the feelings that you had. Um, and, and, and the body language and what was communicated that wasn't captured on audio, or what was communicated that wasn't captured in um, the transcription. So just as a, a best practice in doing this type of research, it's important to recognize um, that there's going to be a huge distance between the time of collecting data and the analysis of that data. Um, the next thing that I want to uh, discuss, just really as the last point, in personal experience story, this is this is very important. Um, in personal experience stories, as we said, personal experience stories can be very episodic, right? Um, and in communicating a personal experience story, and in you going back analyzing later personal experience stories, you have to recognize that there's going to be in a good personal experience story, if you select this, there should be, there should be, right, there should be some change in the subject's interpretation of something, right? So imagine that you have a subject and here's a time A in their life, and here's a time B in their life, and here's where you are now, right? This is the interview, um, and you're asking them about different times in their life, right? The individual is going to be reflecting back on different times in their life and telling you different episodes, different experiences that they had in their life. So let me give you uh, an example. That would be a good personal, a good, uh, fo a good um, use of narrative research and specifically personal experience story um, to facilitate you know, your, your research agenda. Um, something that might be of interest is um, of collecting the narrative story stories of women who experience um, sexual discrimination in the workforce, right? And you can imagine that um, a woman who is, who, who is old enough, maybe in her 80s or so, um, might, at one point in her life might have experienced very, very high levels of sexual discrimination because of, you know, because of the culture at the time, right? Women are supposed to do this, women are going to, you know, there's a particular role that they have and, um, and there's a particular way that society interprets their role and interprets them as a class of people and and so on and so on and so on, right? Uh, it might be the case that at a later point in our life, this woman it has now become the CEO of a huge company, and, or this woman has risen to um, a particular level of power in the, in the same organization, organization or a different organization. Really good personal, uh, uh, um, uh, personal experience stories have this 
had a huge, have a huge distinction, a huge transformation in the narrative, right, um, based on changes which are cultural, right? A lot of their story is, and the change that happens to them in their story is a result of some underlying change, right? So where this is the, um, I was abbreviated PES, where this is the personal episodic story, right? Uh, I keep on saying episodic, personal experience story. We have to recognize that um, the vast majority, if not all, and I would, I, I would be hard pressed to think of some that didn't have some correlation, but I'm sure they are. The vast majority of personal experience stories, um, the change that happens in the individual is a result of some underlying change. It could be religious, it could be social, it could be marital, it could be familial, it could be cultural, it could be, uh, it could be whatever, fill in the blank. It's important to recognize in interviewing the, the, uh, the participant, the research subject, that you don't just ask about the personal experiences, right? Um, you need to go beyond the personal experience to ask the individual, what was it about either you or the environment that you lived in at the time that would account for the change between A and B. Oh, well, you know, I think what happened was it was, you know, the civil rights movement had finally ended uh, and women had um, attained a level of uh, respectability and appreciation within our society, blah, 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 blah. I don't know if a participant would answer it like that, but you, you, you have an understanding. We want to get to the underlying significance, the meaning, behind the personal experience story. It's this account, right, this substrate, this, this foundational account, that's going to give us insight, offer insight, greater depth into the transition between different periods in the individual's life, right? So in, in accessing and interviewing, um, and I'll talk about interviewing best practices uh, in another video, uh, as a matter of, yeah, I'll talk about best practices for interviewing in another video, but it's important to recognize with um, biographical, autobiographical, life history, well, less autobiographical, life history, personal experience story, and oral history. Um, this is going to be very, very data intensive. You're going to have lots and lots of data that you're going to have to go through. Lots and lots of transcriptions, lots and lots of audio. I mean, I don't know how much audio I had when it was done. Maybe, you know, maybe th mm, 20 to 30 hours worth of audio that I had to go back through. And, you know, pages and pages and pages of, of transcriptions to, to go through and assess and make sense of it all. It's a lot of information. The point of um, engaging the participant is to recognize that what we want to do is we want to get to the meaning, the significance of the changes in their story. Um, we want to identify the climaxes in their story. We want to identify the resolution to, the, to their story. We want to identify the underlying conflict in their story and what have you. Um, the better you are at identifying these, um, these issues, the richer your research will be, the richer, the richer your research is, the more your research will contribute to the overall understanding and the overall development of um, narrative research as such. So um, that concludes the first half of the first section of narrative research. Um, there's a second half which I'll do in subsequent videos uh, on narrative research and then we'll move on to um, phenomenological research. Uh, so with that being said, I want to thank you for taking the time uh, to watch my videos. Hopefully this was informative. Again, it was an introduction. In the second half, I will uh, continue the discussion of narrative research and qualitative research methods. I'm uh, Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Thanks for taking the time to watch my video. Goodbye.